Are you afraid police will arrest you? No. I know there's, there's no basis. I had nothing to do with her disappearance. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back for my first official true crime video. Some of you might not know this, but I have somewhat of an obsession with these kind of real-life stories. Ever since I was a kid, I started getting invested into high-profile cases that would make headlines around the country. Now, I am sure most of you might know me as a Game of Thrones and a Song of Ice and Fire fan, but I might be an even bigger fan of these real-life stories. I think I spend more time watching these documentaries than I do almost anything else, so I decided I wanted to start discussing these cases with everyone else who may be interested in them, just like me. This is why I started my channel after all, so I could talk about whatever is on my mind. Lately, I have become reinvested in the Scott and Lacey Peterson case. The main suspect was arrested, convicted, and even condemned. He has been living on death row ever since his conviction, but in a shocking turn of events, that has now been reversed. As of right now, he is no longer on death row, and some even believe he should have never been there at all. Now, I actually think he is guilty myself, but if I'm honest, I don't think he should have been convicted, based on the evidence they had. I think the prosecutors had a very weak case, but at the end of the day, I do think he is right where he belongs. If you haven't heard of Scott and Lacey Peterson, then you might be a little lost right now. Scott and Lacey met each other during their college years when they were working at a diner together. According to Scott, Lacey wrote down her number for him to have, but he kind of thought it was a joke, so he threw it away. After a second attempt, Scott and Lacey did speak, and eventually began dating each other. Based on everything I've read, Scott seemed like he was one of those blue-blood, high-society rich kids. He was good-looking, he spent a lot of time on the golf course, and he was in the wine and cigar club. Lacey, on the other hand, was a sweetheart. She was gorgeous, smart, funny, and all those things you want to find in a girlfriend. After being together for several years, everything seemed to be going very well. They got married, they got a house together, and their life was only just beginning. So, the next logical step is to have a child. Right around the beginning of 2002, Lacey did become pregnant with their son, who they would name Connor. As far as Lacey knew, this was about to be the beginning of a wonderful life, but something happened on Christmas Eve of 2002 that changed everything. With only a few weeks left before Lacey gave birth to their son, she goes missing. Now, let's see what Scott said happened on the day she disappeared. On December 24th, Christmas Eve of 2002, Scott says he wakes up at 8 a.m. that day. According to what he said, Lacey woke up before him. He said she was eating cereal when he got out of bed, so he ends up grabbing himself a bowl of cereal as well. While they're sitting there eating, they started watching her favorite show, Martha Stewart, around 9 or 10 in the morning. Lacey was also cleaning up around the house, mopping the floor before she ended up walking the dog. Scott says it was too cold to go golfing, so he decided to go fishing instead. For some reason, he said it was too cold to stand on a golf course, but it wasn't too cold to go fishing in the San Francisco Bay. One of Scott's neighbors saw him loading umbrellas in his truck somewhere around 9.30. So, Scott gets ready for the day, and he leaves for the warehouse where his brand new boat is at, which is about three miles away from their house. For whatever reason, Scott was keeping his boat at the warehouse where he worked out of as some sort of fertilizer salesman. After Scott does arrive at the warehouse, he goes onto his computer sometime between 10.30 and 11 a.m. While he's there, he also makes some of his own homemade anchors out of concrete mix for when he goes fishing. Later, he will say that he only made one anchor, but there might be some evidence that shows he made more than one, but I will get back to that later. We're not exactly sure how long this takes him, but afterwards, he hooks up his boat to his truck and then he leaves. It takes him about one and a half hours to get to the Berkeley Marina and the San Francisco Bay. While Scott was still at the warehouse, his neighbor, Karen Service, finds the Peterson dog outside their home around 10.18 a.m. that day. We know that Scott was definitely gone at that time because she doesn't see his car there. Now, if you remember, Scott said Lacey was going to walk their dog that morning. So it seemed a bit odd when their neighbor found their dog walking around in the yard by itself with its leash still on. So the neighbor Karen locks their dog up in their backyard, then she leaves. 
We know that Scott was definitely at the Berkeley Marina at 12.54 p.m. that day because he has a receipt from when he arrived at the marina. Scott said he was only out on the water from about 1 to 2 p.m. that day. Afterwards, when Scott leaves, he calls Lacey at home and he calls her on her cell phone by 2.15 p.m. Scott drops off the boat at his warehouse around 4.30 and when Scott gets home, he says the dog was in the backyard by itself on its leash and their door was unlocked. The very first thing he does when he gets inside the house is he immediately throws his wet clothes in the washer, then he gets a shower. He says he doesn't call Lacey's mom until after. This call is around 5.17 p.m. Scott tells Lacey's mom the car and the dog are here, but Lacey isn't. Obviously, Lacey's mom says she hasn't seen her or heard from her either. This is when Lacey's stepfather calls 911 around 5.47 p.m. Shortly after this is when the cops meet Lacey's parents in the East La Loma Park around 6 p.m. This is apparently where Lacey liked to walk their dog, but unfortunately, they don't find her there. So, the cops want to search Scott and Lacey's house next. When they get there, they find that there's no signs of forced entry. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. There was no evidence of a struggle, so it looked like if something did happen to Lacey, it did not happen inside of their house. So, from around 6.20 p.m. to 1.19 a.m., the cops searched their house in Scott's warehouse the very first night. While they were searching the house, one of the investigators interviewed Scott down at the station. Scott says they woke up that morning and they were watching Lacey's favorite show. Martha Stewart was making cookies or something with lemon meringue. The investigators did later fact check this and Scott was right. That's exactly what Martha Stewart was making on that episode. The investigator also asked Scott, if they were having any issues with their marriage. You guys, you guys had any problems, uh, marriage problems? Everything's good. What he does fail to admit is that he has been cheating on Lacey for the last several months. He obviously wasn't very happy, otherwise he would not be looking for love and affection outside of the marriage. But that alone does not automatically mean Scott did something to his wife. Scott said the cops were looking at him as a suspect that first night, and this is normal with these kind of investigations. They usually start from the inside, then they work their way out. Now, when they were in the driveway searching Scott and Lacey's house, he heard one of the cops say over the radio, the husband is suspicious. When the detective met with Scott the following day on Christmas, he found it odd that Scott did not seem interested in the investigation. He wasn't asking any questions about what they were up to, in terms of finding Lacey or solving the case. Scott was also asked on Christmas Eve if he would take a lie detector test to eliminate himself as a suspect. He originally said yes, but later he declines. Now obviously, the detective says this makes him look even more suspicious. Scott's dad told him not to do it, so that's what he did. Nothing. In the following days of Lacey's disappearance, the response from their community was overwhelming. Everyone was out looking for Lacey. They actually ran out of flyers and maps. There were volunteers out searching on foot, horseback, and even by boat. There were massive searches underway immediately. The investigators also had divers searching the San Francisco Bay for Lacey's body. It says they did dozens of searches in the bay. Obviously, they were desperately trying to find Lacey. They were even using sonar technology to search under the water, but they had no luck. So, after a few days, the police end up coming back to the Peterson house to search it again. The detective said they wanted to search the house again because they wanted to monitor Scott's behavior and demeanor. Scott did not allow them to search the house the second time. They executed the search warrant anyway. The investigator said if Scott has nothing to hide, then he should let them search the house. During the search, they found Scott's behavior to be odd because he seemed more concerned about his house and cars than he did his missing wife. For example, when one of the cops set down a glass of water, Scott ran over and made sure the glass was sitting on a coaster. Then, when another one of the cops opened up his car door, Scott made sure to stick a glove in front of the door so it did not scratch the car sitting next to it. The investigators removed several items out of Scott's house to search for any traces of evidence related to Lacey's disappearance. They also took both of the cars and their computers from the house to search for evidence. Based on what I have seen, they did not find anything in Scott and Lacey's house, nor did they find anything at Scott's warehouse except for one of Lacey's hairs that were found inside of an old pair of pliers. We later find out that the cops removed over a hundred different bags of evidence from Scott's house and the warehouse. 
But after all that was done, the investigators basically found no worthy evidence to show during the trial. They did, however, find something interesting at the warehouse. As I was saying before, they found dry cement mix all over the floor, showing that Scott had made his own anchors. Scott said he had only made one, but they said it appeared as if he had made four. When they asked him what he did with the rest of the cement mix, he said he dumped it out near the driveway at his house to fill in a hole in the ground. Later, we do see a photo that appears to show some cement mix near Scott's driveway. However, when that was tested, it was shown to be a different type of cement mix that was found in the warehouse. So, if that's the case, then where did the rest go? My guess is, he made several anchors, most likely to weigh down a body. At this time, almost everyone was getting upset with how Scott was reacting to his wife's disappearance. He was acting as if he did not care. Scott's reaction and his demeanor meant a lot to the public. One of the big issues when having a case covered by this amount of media outlets is how the real evidence can sometimes get lost. These different news organizations have to feed the beast, so they will begin to report on anything and everything they can. Now, regardless of how Scott was acting, Lacey's family was initially on his side at the beginning. They honestly did believe he was innocent. Every one of their friends thought they were great together. Scott's dad said, Scott never looked happier than when he was with Lacey. One of Scott's friends said, he wanted to start a family with his wife. He could not wait to be a father. Now this is interesting because we do come to find out that Scott no longer had interest in his wife. He started to cheat on Lacey several months ago, and he would even tell his mistress Amber that he did not want to have any kids. Lacey's mom, Sharon Roca, said that Lacey had once told her that Scott would not feel her belly while she was pregnant. I happen to think this was Scott's way of staying disconnected from the situation. He did not want any children, so by not feeling his wife's belly and feeling the baby kick, he could continue living his life as if this wasn't really happening, because he was hoping to find a way out of being a father. Obviously, this is my speculation. Now, the first major lead that doesn't point at Scott comes up about six days later on December 30th. This is when everyone finds out about a burglary that happened directly across the street from Scott and Lacey's house. There was a witness that lives near Scott and Lacey, who was driving by their house on the morning of December 24th, the same day Lacey went missing. Around 11.40 a.m. that morning, the witness said they saw some suspicious-looking people standing outside of a white van. The witness doesn't realize it till later, but when she finds out the Medina's house was broken into, most likely on the same day of the 24th, she later puts two and two together, realizing it would have been on the same day that Lacey went missing. At first, Lacey's brother wanted to focus on the burglary because it did seem like one hell of a coincidence. This was looking like a good lead, but the investigators come out and say the burglary actually happened on the 26th. That would have been days after Lacey was already missing. This did not seem very likely though, because how could the burglars have broken into that house when the street already had cop cars and news vehicles on the block reporting on Lacey's disappearance? Did the investigators really try to bury this lead because they were so focused on Scott? There was a news anchor that said there is no way that burglary happened on a 26 because he was standing outside the Peterson home that morning and he did not see anything out of the ordinary. He said he would have seen a suspicious van, or suspicious characters leaving the house directly across the street. We find out later that the witness was right. The robbery happened on the morning of Christmas Eve, the same morning Lacey went missing. So maybe, just maybe, Lacey was outside walking the dog as this was happening. Maybe Lacey tried to stop these men from robbing her neighbor's house, and things went horribly wrong. Maybe they abducted Lacey because she was a witness. Honestly, who knows? When this case does eventually go to trial, the jury does not hear any of this. Now, what's very interesting is when one of the burglars, Scott Todd, was interviewed by the detectives about the burglary, the first words out of his mouth were, I had nothing to do with the missing pregnant girl. But for some reason, the investigators did not want to talk to him about Lacey's disappearance. They already had their eyes fixated on Scott Peterson. Several weeks before the trial was over, there was an inmate at the jail who reaches out to one of the investigators working for Scott's defense team. He said that he had information about the burglary across the street from the Peterson home. This inmate at the jail did give Scott's lawyers a name, Sean Tenbrink, and when they search his name in the database, they find out one of the watch commanders at the jail had been trying to contact the police about this inmate. 
Apparently, this inmate who was at the jail had a phone conversation with his brother, who was a very close friend of Scott Todd, the man who robbed the house across the street from the Petersons. During this conversation, he said that Scott Todd told him Lacey did confront them during the burglary, and he threatened Lacey. When Lacey's name came up during the conversation, Sean told his brother to shut up several times. He knew the conversation was monitored since they were in jail. Now, the watch commander who was working that night knew this was significant, so he recorded the conversation and he did send it to the Modesto police. He called this in back in January, only a few weeks after Lacey went missing, long before the trial was ever started. He called this in several times before they would even call him back. He said he gave a copy of the recording to the investigators, but they said they don't have one. It sounds like they wanted this to be buried. They had no interest in exploring other options. Now, let me get back to Scott Peterson. Let me show you where things started to go sideways for Scott and Lacey. I believe this all started when Scott met another woman named Amber Fry. One thing that I always found interesting was the fact that Scott even began dating Amber when she already had a child. During one of their phone conversations, Scott tells Amber that he doesn't want to have any kids. I think it's interesting because I would assume that most of the public thinks that Scott killed Lacey because he did not want to become a father, yet he goes after another woman who already had a child. Scott's relationship with Amber Fry begins five weeks before Lacey goes missing. Amber's friend, Sean, told her about this guy that she had met at a work convention. Amber's friend said, Scott is perfect for you. So she agrees to meet him, and they do begin dating. While Lacey's at home getting ready to bring their first child into this world, Scott is out having fun with his new girlfriend. At first, Amber felt like their relationship was great. That was until Scott admitted that he had lied to her. He said there was something that he needed to tell her. Scott revealed that he had been married, but he said he lost his wife. He said this would be the first holiday season without her. For a while, Amber believes him and even feels sorry for him. She doesn't begin to find out what's really happening until a couple days later after Christmas when her friend hands her the newspaper, which had Scott and Lacey's photo all over it. This is when Amber realizes Scott's wife had recently gone missing, after he had already said she was dead. When the investigators get into contact with Amber, she agreed to help them in their investigation. They end up going to Radio Shack to get a device to use on her phone so they could record her conversations with Scott. Like always, he lies during the conversations, saying he's over in France, while he's actually in Modesto, looking for his missing wife and unborn child. Scott actually calls her during Lacey's candlelight vigil on New Year's Eve, saying that he's standing under the Eiffel Tower. I mean, what a scumbag. Amber does eventually confront Scott, because he said his wife was dead, and this would be the first holidays without her. You see, Scott said this around December 9th, several weeks before his wife actually went missing. This is also allegedly the same exact day he bought his boat. The day Scott tells his new girlfriend that his wife is dead was the same day he goes out and buys a boat. I wonder what his intentions were. Now, how would he have predicted his wife's death weeks before it happened unless he knew it would happen? Or can he guess the future? This shows Scott has been lying to everyone. When Scott later sits down for an interview, he lies right to everyone on national TV when he says he revealed his relationship with Amber to the police. He says that he told them from day one, but during his interrogation, you can see that he never mentions it. He actually said everything was fine between him and his wife. He also said that he told his wife about Amber before she went missing, but of course, Lacey isn't there to confirm this so he can say whatever the hell he wants. When Amber Fry comes out as Scott's secret lover, Lacey's family instantly turns on him. They begin to question what else he might be hiding. This is when the Volunteer Center is shut down immediately. They felt betrayed by Scott, and rightfully so. Shortly after all of this is when there is another major development in the case. The bodies of Lacey and her son Connor are found washed up on the shore of the San Francisco Bay. Baby Connor is actually found first. Then about 18 hours later, they found a torso that washed up in the bay. At first, they weren't even exactly sure if it was a man or a woman. That was until the DNA results came back, confirming it was Lacey and her son. Lacey's hands, feet, and her head were missing from the body. This is when Scott goes from suspect number one 
to a wanted man. All of the investigators now firmly believe Scott Peterson dumped his wife's body in the bay when he went fishing there on Christmas Eve, the same day she went missing. The only thing is, no one has seen Scott at his house lately. His neighbors hadn't seen him in weeks. Scott was actually hiding out down in San Diego with his family. On the same day that the bodies were found, the cops wanted to arrest Scott. They had been following him around all day, while Scott was weaving in and out of traffic. According to Scott, he said that he thought he was being followed by the news media. Because Scott was driving so erratically, the cops ultimately decided to take him into custody at that time, although the DNA results were still not back in from the lab. When they end up searching his car, this is when things get interesting. Inside of his car, they find camping gear, nearly $15,000 in cash, his brother's identification, and four different cell phones. They believe Scott had been living out of his car, and Scott also looked slightly different. He now had a beard, and all of his hair was dyed. It seemed as if Scott was about to make a run for the border, but as always, Scott had an excuse for everything found in his vehicle. When the investigators informed him that the bodies found in the bay were in fact his missing wife and son, he had no reaction. It's almost as if Scott knew this day was coming, but you know what they say? Everyone handles grief in their own way. Shortly after Scott is arrested, he has his first hearing, where he pleads not guilty. This is when Scott's family hires Mark Gregaros as his lawyer for about $1 million. He was a high-profile lawyer, who is used to being in the spotlight because he's handled other cases that were in the public eye. When the case does eventually go to trial, the investigator's theory is Scott killed Lacey on the night of December 23rd. He then made his anchors to attach the each one of her limbs, including around her neck. Then he loaded her up in the boat, took her to the marina, and dumped her body in the bay. Now, what's interesting is there was a witness at the marina that day. This witness said they saw Scott launching his boat into the water, and the boat did appear to be empty inside. For some reason, Scott's lawyer never had the witness testify for him. During the opening statements of the trial, Scott's attorney delivers a blow to the prosecution's theory. They had claimed that Scott lied about what he did the morning Lacey went missing. They said he had lied about watching Martha Stewart with his wife. But Scott's lawyer did show a recording of that episode in front of the jury. Scott was exactly right about what Martha was making on her show that day. Another thing that worked in Scott's favor was what the computer analyst discovered. He learned that someone from the Peterson home was on the computer the morning Lacey went missing, looking up umbrellas that had sunflowers on them. Lacey was known to love sunflowers, so they assumed that it was her looking it up. So, the question is, if Lacey was murdered on the night of the 23rd, as they suspect, then how was she looking up umbrellas and watching Martha Stewart on the morning of the 24th? Since there were no witnesses to the murder, and no physical evidence showing Scott did this to his wife and unborn child, the state did not have much to go with. One of the main things that ended up being a major turning point for the prosecution were the recordings of Scott and Amber's phone calls. Up until then, the prosecution had a very weak case. Now the jury was finally able to hear Scott lying about certain details to Amber. When the jury hears this, this is when they question everything else he's ever said. Then they test the boat, to see if Scott could have possibly thrown Lacey out of the boat without sinking it. They actually brought in an expert fisherman who knows how to handle large fish, roughly the weight of Lacey, who was about 150 pounds at the time. They did this test several different times, and the boat flipped over every time, getting the man inside soaking wet. Scott's lawyer said this made him look innocent because Scott could not have successfully done this. However, when Scott got home the day from the marina, we know that he was soaking wet, because the first thing he told the cops was when he got home, he threw his soaking wet clothes in the washer, then he got in the shower. Now, I have seen other videos say that the boat that was used during the test was not the same one that Scott had, but that's not accurate. They specifically said it was the same boat, by the same manufacturing company, and they had even done that test at the identical time of the year in the bay. The judge would not allow this expert to be added into the evidence, though, because he said it was not similar enough to the state's theory of what happened the day Scott would have done this. One of the other things the defense attorney shot down was the evidence discovered by the cadaver dogs. Apparently, the dogs were able to find Lacey sent at the marina where Scott had allegedly taken her body, but they find out almost immediately that these dogs failed to earn their certifications. Therefore, the dogs were not very reliable. 
One of the other things that happened was, there was a doctor that stated baby Connor was still alive up until December 29th. Based on his findings, this would have meant Scott could not have thrown Lacey in the bay on the 24th, which is what the prosecutors claimed. If this were accurate, Lacey and her baby would have still been alive five days after Scott reported her missing. If this was right, then that would almost have to mean that someone else abducted Lacey because Scott's house and warehouse had already been searched by the cops. And all the news outlets had already descended onto those locations. We know Lacey obviously wasn't being held there captive. So if she was still alive up until December 29th, that means she would have been held captive somewhere else. This doctor's credibility was put into question during the cross-examination. And this is when that theory began to fall apart. There were several different things the doctor could not explain, and he got to the point of frustration when he said, give me some slack. Everything this doctor said was now irrelevant. The jury no longer took the doctor serious after that. However, there was another doctor who said baby Connor may have been alive up until January 3rd. Based on a scientific formula, that determines how old a baby is at the time of their death, based upon the size of their bones. If this was accurate, Connor would have died well after Scott was under investigation. How could he have got rid of the bodies in the bay when his boat was already seized into evidence? Now let's get into the witnesses who say they saw Lacey walking the dog that day. Sometime between 9.50 and 10 a.m., witnesses say they saw a woman, who appeared to be very pregnant, walking a dog the day Lacey went missing. Another witness says she saw someone fitting Lacey's description walking a dog in the park. Wild men were following her. Shortly after the witness say they saw this, the men begin to yell at this woman, telling her to shut the dog up. The investigator stated that no one came forward about seeing Lacey walking the dog. But one witness says he told this to a motorcycle cop, so we really don't know who's lying. If the witnesses are right, and they did see Lacey... How did Scott have Lacey with him as he made his way to the bay to dump her body? Something doesn't add up here. Another big part of the case is witnesses seeing Lacey walk the dog after Scott left that day. Witnesses said they saw Lacey walking the dog around the neighborhood and in the local park around 10.30 to 10.45 a.m. that day. However, we know the Peterson's neighbor, Karen Service, actually found their dog loose in the yard around 10.18 a.m. This neighbor secured the dog in the backyard, then left. So how did the witnesses see Lacey walking the dog at this time, when the dog was already in the backyard after the neighbor had left it there? Either these witnesses saw someone else, or the time they think they saw Lacey was way off. So as you can see, there was a good amount of evidence that was in Scott's favor, but there was also a good amount of evidence that shows Scott did this himself. Now I want to discuss what happened during the deliberations because this is when things turn into a disaster. For those of you that don't know or simply don't remember, this Scott and Lacey Peterson case became a national story almost immediately. From the day that Lacey went missing up until the verdict was read, this story made headlines almost every single day. It became a media circus. I think most of America thought Scott was guilty long before he ever had his day in court. The public opinion on this case could not be avoided, and I think most of us had our minds made up well before all the evidence was known. When this happens, it's very hard for someone to get a fair trial. Even if the suspect is guilty and everyone knows it, it still has to be proven in a court of law. I'm not confident that happened in this case. Now, during the first day of deliberations, the jury voted on whether they thought he was guilty or innocent. The votes came out 10 to 2, in favor of Scott being guilty, but the foreman of the jury voted innocent. I find this to be interesting because the foreman was arguably the smartest man in the room. He is basically the captain of the jury. This foreman was not only a doctor, but he was also a lawyer. Even some of the other jurors said this foreman was taking notes on every single detail. So it almost sounds as if he wanted to be fair, instead of basing his opinion off emotion. This is what you want, and this is what you need in a juror especially on a case that involves a double homicide. Now, on day five of the deliberations, one of the jurors decided to look up something on the internet about the case, and this led to her being removed from the jury. Now, a new juror had to be brought in for the deliberations, but they had to start them all over again. This new member of the jury, Rochelle, comes in and immediately says Scott is guilty. I mean, as soon as she walked in, she did not want to discuss it with anyone else. She did not want to go through the evidence logically. 
she already had it in her mind that Scott was guilty. Now keep in mind, this new juror, Rochelle, is the reason Scott's death penalty was recently reversed. Like I said before, I fully believe Scott is guilty, but this is not how things are done. The original foreman of the jury did not want to allow this to happen. He more or less said she cannot come in here and dictate the entire room. At this time, the foreman of the jury was still thinking about voting Scott not guilty. Well, all the other jurors found a way to get the foreman off of the jury. They were very impatient. They did not want to waste any more time looking at the evidence logically. So, for the second time in two days, another juror was dismissed. It would have actually been a hung jury if not for the foreman leaving the trial. Once that happened, everything changed. Now the new juror, Rochelle, had control over the entire room. Scott would now be found guilty and sentenced to death. This happened in less than 24 hours after Rochelle was brought into the deliberations room. It was later discovered that Rochelle had been involved in her own kind of domestic dispute that left her in fear for her own unborn child. So you can see why she would have such an emotional investment in a case that involves the death of an unborn child. She should never have been allowed on this case, but since she lied about it, she was able to slip by. Now at the end of the day, I think Scott is exactly where he belongs. And I want to tell you some of the reasons why I believe Scott is guilty. There is one thing Scott did that I can never get over. No matter how much evidence makes me think he did not do it, there is always one thing that I always go back to that lets me know he's guilty. I'm referring to when Scott told his new girlfriend Amber that this would be the first holiday without his wife. This lets me know exactly what Scott wanted. He wanted his wife gone. He said this to Amber on December 9th, but Lacey did not vanish until Christmas Eve. Amber even recorded their phone conversation where Scott admits that he said this before Lacey went missing. Scott was basically Chris Watts before Chris Watts was Chris Watts, if you know what I mean. Scott found a new girlfriend and soon realized he no longer wanted to be a father. He wanted this new life instead, but in order to have the new life, he would have to get rid of the old one. And that started by Scott telling Amber that his wife was already gone, because he knew one day she really would be gone. That's why he bought that boat within hours of saying that. He knew he would have to make her disappear. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is what happened when the investigators looked into the hard drives on Scott's computer. When the computer expert analyzed his five hard drives, there were some very interesting revelations. On the same exact day Scott went online to buy his new boat, he also started researching the water currents in the San Francisco Bay. They found out that Scott was looking at different maps of the bay, as well as fishing reports and a U.S. Geological Survey chart of the water currents. I think Scott was looking this up so he could make sure Lacey's body would drift out to the sea after he dumped it in the bay. Think about what Scott said when he was interviewed by the investigators on the day Lacey went missing. He said he wanted to go golfing that morning, but it was way too cold, so he went fishing instead. I don't know about you, but fishing on the bay would have been a hell of a lot colder than golfing on the land. I've been to the San Francisco Bay, and I was even there in the springtime, and let me tell you something. It was freezing out on the bay when I was there. I can only imagine what it must have felt like in December. Besides, who goes fishing on Christmas Eve of all days, when you have a pregnant wife at home who is due almost any day? One of the other things that really disgusted me about Scott was the fact that he got rid of Lacey's Land Rover shortly after she went missing. That's right, only weeks after Lacey went missing, Scott wanted to get himself a new truck. So he traded in Lacey's only car so he could get it. You know why? Because Scott knew she wasn't coming back home. In Scott's mind, there was no reason to have Lacey's things around the house anymore because he knew she wasn't coming back. He actually had the nerve to do this even while he was under the microscope of the investigators and the news reporters. That just shows you his character. Now, you know what makes this even sadder? The man who owned that car lot, the one that Scott went to to trade in Lacey's Land Rover, he actually gave that back to Lacey's family himself. Even though the owner of the car lot would be losing money on this, he did not want the Land Rover for himself. He said he wanted to give the car back to Lacey's family because he wanted Lacey to have a car for when she came back home. So he gave it to Lacey's mom and dad. Almost one year before Lacey went missing, Scott took out life insurance of nearly $250,000 on his wife. Even after he was convicted, he fought to get that money. 
he did not want Lacey's mom and dad to have it. Again, this is only another example of his character. In my mind, Scott did this. He wanted a new life with his new girlfriend, but for some reason, he felt like the best way to do this was to murder his wife and unborn son. I will never understand why some men think this is the better option. Get a divorce, fellas. Yeah, it might be a headache, and it might even be expensive, but what's worse, losing half of everything or losing everything? If you no longer want to be in a relationship with someone, then leave them. Don't be a monster who kills your entire family, then discards them like they're trash. Believe me, this won't make life any easier for you. But what do I know? Do you think Scott is guilty or innocent? Leave me your thoughts down below. I want to thank everyone for watching my first official true crime video. This was a lot of fun to make, and hopefully, if enough of you like the video, then I will make more like this. Either way, have a great day everyone. I will see you again very soon. Bye.